Angela O'Leary was born in Providence, Rhode Island in 1877 or 1879. No one really knows for sure. The census says 1877, but Angela always said 1879. Angela's father was Charles Wallace O'Leary. He became Charles Wallace O'Leary, M.D. He was a doctor, and he was a surgeon in the Civil War. He was an Irish immigrant, born in Ireland in 1829. And by the Civil War, he was a well-regarded surgeon, um, and of course his services were desperately needed during that conflict. There's a very lovely painting of Dr. O'Leary on horseback, painted by a very grateful patient. Angela's mother's name was Louise. She was born in Cincinnati in 1839. Now, Angela was one of six children, and her name was actually Catherine Angela O'Leary. Well, it's hard to tell the story about Angela without talking about two of her closest friends, John Aldrich and Sidney Burley. Now, Sidney and John were very close friends. In fact, in Angel's Lane by George Minor, they talk about going down to Bonnet Shores to paint for weeks at a time. They were very, all very close, and they traveled together. Um, the Burleys, and that would be Mrs. Burley, Mrs. Sarah Burley, and Sydney, took trips to Europe and brought Angela along. Sometimes Sydney and Angela went alone. Uh, another mutual friend of the family, Tom Crosby, an actor and member of the art club from 1918 till his death in 1940s. Tom Crosby was a bit of an interesting fellow. He was an actor, fairly well known. He was also a co-founder of the Barker Street Playhouse, or the Players, down on uh, Benefit Street here. And again, one of the regulars for Sunday dinner at the Aldrich House. I think Tom may have been Angela's closest friend. In looking back on some writings, they seemed to spend an awful lot of time together. It wasn't romantic, I don't think, in any way. I think they were just kindred spirits. If you've had the good fortune to take a tour of our fleur-de-lis studios, you'll find the grandest of the studios, of course, is that of the man who built the bill, and that was Sidney Burke, helped quite a bit by John Aldrich and by Charles Walter Stetson. But upstairs, in the building are a bit more modest studio, and one of those was Angela's. And it's connected, as you go up the stairway, it's connected in the front door to the stairway, and there's a back door entrance that goes on to the Juliet balcony in Sidney Burley's studio. And why the back door entrance, I couldn't say. I suspect it was always there and the studio was built that way. Truly the star of the exhibition is the portrait of Angela by Carl Nordell. The most powerful aspect of that painting, and part of it has to do with where it's hung. It looks over Angel's Lane, she sits there with an air of dignity and a bit of swagger, if you will, and surveys the whole place. And she also looks right over in this room at the first 11 presidents of the Providence Art Club, and I always wonder about the interaction between the two. I think with anyone who dies too young, there is always the thought of what if and what was her artistic promise. She had a very successful show up in Boston, and for artists in Providence in the 19, in the 19 teens, in, the, in, in that period, having a Boston show was quite a coup. And so she seemingly was on her way. A lot of things were falling into place. As I said, she had a very successful show here with Eliza Gardner, her show up in Boston. There were other shows. And I think her career at age 40-something was on its way and was starting to really move forward. My guess is it would have continued to. The collections committee had considered an Angelo Leary show for quite some time. Over the last 10 years, we've honored quite a few of our early artists, and Angela was notably absent from that. Mr. Ratcliffe and I 
realized that the 100th anniversary of her death was upon us, and it seemed like an opportune time to talk about Angela, show her work again, and reintroduce her to some of the members who may not know much about her. So Angela O'Leary is an artist, is, um, an artist that not that many people know, um, and she creates these wonderful little, like almost cabinet-sized uh, paintings, watercolors, and they're just so intimate. Uh, the subject matter is tells a story, and they're just lovely. Technically, they're lovely, and they're lo lovely because they're very narrative. Well, most people always pair Angela O'Leary with Sydney Burley. Uh, Sydney Burley was the instructor for two of her courses when she was at Rhode Island School of Design, and he also painted in a very similar small format, and the format uh, was usually capturing individuals or people or small landscapes, and Angela did that, but she did not do a lot of landscape. Angela was all about people. Uh, people on the streets, women at the market, uh, everyday life. Uh, so when you look at a Sydney Burley and you look at an Angela O'Leary next to each other, you can always tell the difference because of subject matter generally. When I look at Sydney Burley and Angela O'Leary and I look at their painting styles, you can see the influence that Sidney Burley had on Angela O'Leary. And oftentimes I feel like Angela O'Leary is dismissed as being a bit derivative of Sidney Burley, but she's actually very unique and very different. Sidney Burley tends to do a lot of line. He's an expert on line as well as the watercolor technique. So he combines the two of them. And then he'll always throw a little wash in so that he can get some highlights and some details. Angela, on the other hand, is not as interested in line as Sydney was. She's more interested in making the watercolor medium bleed and then have it just kind of move into the background. They're very uh, evocative, mysterious, and she also does what Burley does in using a gouache so that she can then tighten up her composition at the very end. So in one of the reviews of Angela Leary, the critic talked about her sense of humor and her whimsy. And I find that fascinating because I don't necessarily find her whimsical. So if it is a woman sitting on the side with balloons, well, it might appear to be kind of a humorous scene. You really look at the face of the woman and she's very pensive. She's seriously selling her balloons for the end of the day. She's really about street life, uh, women who have to work on the street, and how they exist in the city and are integrated in the city of Providence at the time. So Angela Leary attended RISD, and it's very interesting to me because later on she would exhibit with other RISD women graduates. But the really first generation of great women artists who came out of RISD, they all graduated about 1895. And they set the tone for an artist like Angela O'Leary because when she starts in 1896, she's really, the, the instructors are ready to deal with women. They can still, they can take, uh, you know, life drawing from nudes, they can do all sorts of those things. The two people that to me stand out as her instructors, or actually three people, are Stacy Tolman. And um, Tolman is teaching all of the drawing, the cast drawing, and the figurative drawing. So he is really into creating a, a great figural tradition and skill set for these artists that are going through. And Angela's figures are all very, very well done. You can see she was a good student. The other artists are Sydney Burley, who was teaching the painting class, and also Sydney Burley and Frank Marshall teach the drawing class. So what Angela has is three individuals who become very active at the Providence Art Club as she joins, 
And she has those three different aspects that are very strong in her artwork. Figural work, line, and painting style. In 1914, if you look at Angela O'Leary, she's about 15 years off of her training at RISD and trying to establish herself in, and her career in Providence. And it's difficult because it's a male-dominated uh, art scene. Uh, the Providence Art Club, even though it was founded by many women artists, the opportunities for women really only came in their exhibition opportunities. Oftentimes they were segregated in terms of their painting. So I think Angela did a wonderful job of kind of maneuvering the system in terms of that. She formed very strong friendships with many of her flirtily partners. If you look at her lifetime, in the flirtily at the time, her instructor Sidney Burley is in one of the, the uh, spaces. Stacy Tolman is at the flirtily. Frank Matthewson is at the flirtily. John Aldrich, who was very much part of the Art Workers Guild and, and, and Sidney Burley's life, he's at the Art Club. So she forms this network of very close friends who are her art buddies, so to speak. That, that flirtily connection, that neighborhood kind of community is as important um, as a subsection of the, her membership into the Providence Art Club. It's a close, tight network. In 1910, Angela O'Leary has her first one-person show at the Providence Art Club, which is pretty remarkable considering that she's less than a decade past graduating from Rhode Island School of Design. Now, the Providence Art Club has tremendous talent and really very good artists that are showing. So for her to be awarded that, which meant that there was an art committee that had to accept her works and schedule her in, is, is really such a feather in her cap. In addition to that, she gets a wonderful review in the Providence Journal, uh, talking about how they had been watching her single and double pieces that would show up in juried exhibitions previously. So in a one-person show, she holds up um, with a very good critical review. So I was very fortunate to know David Aldridge, son of uh, John Aldridge. And John Aldridge was a very close friend of Angela O'Leary. And as you know, down through the years, there's many stories that are told. And one of the stories that I was always a suspect of was, did Angela O'Leary commit suicide? Uh, there was very hard to track that down, to document that. And David Aldridge was in, and we were chatting about things. And I said, you know, David, I said, uh, I, I was very curious about Angela. Did you know Angela? He goes, oh, yes, I, I knew Angela very well. She would come you know, paint all the time with my father, we come for dinner and whatever. And I said, is it true that she committed suicide in the Burley studio? And he said, yes. I went over, he said we were having a function at the Providence Art Club, and he said my brothers and I, Angela wasn't there, my brothers and I were given the assignment to run over and, and, and get Angela. And he said, unfortunately, we found her on the floor slumped over and we knew something was terribly wrong. Um, we were probably too young to understand the whole story, um, but he said it was a very sad day. He said because we, she was very much part of our lives and part of our family. So in 1921, Angela is really a very young, experienced artist making her way in the world and achieving uh, and hitting a lot of important highlights. Uh, she gets a show in Boston, she's exhibiting throughout at the art club and doing very, very well. Uh, it's a, really a highlight, a high point in her career. Um, it's just a mystery in many ways why she would take her life in that very same year. Um, it's also hard to reconstruct because clearly mental illness was not discussed at that time and the treatments were probably not there. I mean, so you one speculates, you know, did she have 
an issue with major depression. Um, did this run in the family? I think later on her sister also commits suicide. So uh, it's just very, it's very tragic uh, because it didn't seem to connect with the success she was having as an artist. I mean, she loved her art. She was doing it full time. She had a very close network of friends, um, a, a wonderful family, and so for her to decide to take her life is, is, is just real, will always remain a mystery. If Angela O'Leary had survived, I think she would have become part of this really strong network of women artists at the art club. Eliza Gardner shows with her, uh, Mabel Woodward is also showing um, in group shows with her. I think there were people like Hope Smith, we know that she showed with. I think she would have gone on and really excelled in and developed a much wider audience for her work. When Angela um, passes away in October, they actually, the Province Art Club organized a memorial exhibit for her in November of that same year. And it's pretty remarkable when you look at the memorial show, over a hundred paintings, and also when you look at the catalog, who owned her works. So her works have been collected over time by the Aldridges, the Gamels, the F. Usher Duvall had one. Um, it must have been such a sad and kind of thoughtful period of time for everybody who's coming because I see this wonderful woman artist who's so talented and it's hard to understand. Um, but I think it's such a great tribute uh, that there were not only this exhibition of all these paintings, the really remarkable painter Carmen Odell had done a fabulous uh, portrait of Angela called the Pink Scarf and that um, was introduced the exhibit, uh, pays homage to Angela not only as an artist but as an important individual uh, that people loved and will continue to preserve her memory over time at the art